time already. So my name is Thiago Toral. I work as a software engineer at Italia, and this presentation is about a new project called Trilog. And the point of this project is easing um, the work need for the way you move in the company applications. So this is a list of topics that I would like to cover in this presentation. First, I would like to start by introducing the problem we are trying to address in Relo, which is the problem of media integration. Uh, then I would like to cover uh, quickly how Relo solves this problem for application developers, so that you get an idea of what problems it, it solves for you. And then I would like to illustrate how it works with a, with a demo. Uh, after that, uh, I think it's also interesting for application developers to know uh, how complicated is it to use Grillo uh, from a real application. I mean, what kind of code you have to write, how complex is it, if it's a lot of code or not, so that you get a real idea of how Grillo works and how you can get, uh, use it in your application. And also, uh, for those who are interested in contributing uh, to the project, uh, how complicated it is to add new backends uh, and integration for new services in Grillo. Uh, so I would also like to wrap up the presentation with uh, a bit of code showing how that is done. So um, let's begin with the problem we are trying to address, which is the problem of integration. What do we mean by that? Well, this slide shows uh, a few uh, services that you can use to consume multimedia content. Uh, YouTube, Jamendo, Shavkas, uh, Last.fm, there are many. And I think the trend is that more will come in the future. And uh, the point about these services is that we as users uh, have come to a point in which we use many of them every day. So they, they become part of our daily lives. Uh, there are millions of users around the world using many of these services every day. And on the other hand, we have a bunch of uh, gadgets coming up continuously uh, that have three things in common. They have awesome computing power, they have multimedia capabilities, and they have uh, internet connectivity. So it's only natural that consumers of these gadgets expect to be able to consume content from all these services. But to do that, there are a few challenges that we have to address. Uh, the first one is that um, it's not just about opening a web browser, going to the site of YouTube or any other service <coughs> and consume the content. Users of these gadgets expect a more streamlined solution. Uh, they expect a, a rich user experience that would uh, kind of expose the same experience for all the services and not a different one for each different service. So we expect uh, an user experience that's easy to use, easy to learn. And on the other hand, there is another um, challenge, which is the scalability. As I was saying before, there are many services already exposing content, uh, and more will come, I think. Uh, the problem is uh, how we make a solution for this so that we can add more and more services easily keeping the development effort and the maintenance effort in check. OK. So uh, the problem, uh, or the major problem that we have to take into account when designing solutions that integrate all these services is that there are an enormous quantity of services, and all of them expose different APIs require you to learn different technologies and use different technologies, uh, handle different protocols, limitations, and so on. And the more services you want to integrate in your, in your play, in your solution, the more learning and the more coding and the more maintenance work that you have to, to do. OK, so that's the situation. And how are people addressing this, this problem right now? So. Uh, Usually, individual developers are developing in-house solutions from scratch. I mean, they do all the work by their own. Uh, the problem is that this is not efficient. 
I mean, they are kind of redoing the same thing all over again and not really sharing a lot of the work. Uh, it also leads to a slow development cycle, which in turn leads to a slow time to market as well. I mean, if, if you think about uh, developing software for a set of box, for example, and trying to integrate these kind of services, you would probably have to do a lot of work from scratch. Uh, and that's not good. Uh, it, 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 it really can be done in a different way. And of course, there is the problem of the expensive maintenance. I mean, you have to keep all these services working for you uh, for, for a whole time. And it's, uh, the more services you add, the more, the more maintenance work that you will have to do. So I think this, this, this could be a dead end soon. And we, we should, you should look for alternatives. So how can we uh, solve this problem? Well, I think the, the, the situation should be solved by having some kind of platform level support for this. Uh, if you think about multimedia in general, for example, rendering, uh, we have things like GStreamer. And thanks to that, application development is a lot easier than it was before. Uh, what we need here is something similar for this new problem, which is the problem of service integration. Uh, if we have that, then uh, interested parties who write software using all these services can stop reinventing the wheel every time and start sharing and reusing code as well. Uh, so we would have a place where all these interested parties can collaborate and work together, create framework and components that they can share and reuse in other projects so they can put more effort in things that add more value to their, to their solution. <coughs> So these are the benefits, uh, reduce and share maintenance effort. Uh, we can reduce the amount of time we spend in developing, integrating all these services and maintaining them, so we have extra time that we can use to add more value to, to our solution. Uh, I think what will make the difference for this kind of, of uh, software products will be the user experience that we can. I mean, we will convince the user not because we integrate YouTube or Diamondo, because I think that will happen for all these type of products in, in, at some time. The difference will be in the, in the user experience, how good that is for, for our users. Uh, the problem right now is that we, if we keep uh, or put all our efforts in integrating the services, we run out of time to, to add value to that user experience. But with this approach, we would have that extra time to begin. Of course, we have a faster development cycle with this, and, and and we increase the scalability of the solution because there will be all inter the interested parties sharing uh, the, the development effort. So uh, this is the problem we tried to address with Grillo. Okay, so we created Grillo to help doing that, to be that platform level solution for application developers to use and start building applications on top of it. So Grillo is a framework for easing access to multimedia content, and the idea behind it is that Application developers, they are interested in browsing and searching content from providers, but they don't really care or they don't really need to know how they work internally. I mean, all these different APIs, technologies, protocols, and limitations, that's not interesting for me as an application developer. I just want to browse, search content, and forget about all that stuff. So what Grillo does is to provide a single API on top of all these different services that wraps them and well, makes uh, a unique language for, for the application developer to use to interact with all these services. So the, the, the thing will, will go like this. Uh, application developers write a solution using Grillo. They code their use cases once uh, in a way that's not specific for any particular uh, uh, content provider. And then th that application will work for all the services supported by Grillo. So the more services that are integrated in Grillo, the more services that will be available on the, on the application without extra work. It's very much like, for example, adding new formats or codecs to your streamer that become available to applications without the application having to do anything. So uh, this picture here tries to illustrate a bit uh, what I'm talking about. The yellow boxes on, on the bottom represent different services that expose multimedia content like YouTube or like Shoutcast or UPnP servers or whatever. And on top of that, the green boxes represent different technologies, protocols that we have to learn and use 
for application to consume content from these services. So for example, uh, for YouTube, we, we may use Liberty Data. For local content, if we use Tracker, we can use Lib Tracker, the APIs that Tracker exposes for that. For UPnP, we can use GUPnP and so forth. Uh, the problem is that at, at this point, if I want to write an application that uses all these services, I would have to learn and use all these green boxes here, which is a lot of hardware. But by adding Grillo, which is the, the, the orange section on top of the green boxes, we see that we have individual backends for Grillo that use the specific technologies to grab the content from the services. And on top of these different backends, we expose a single API, which is the one that application developers see and need to use. So for application developers, they don't have to see all these green boxes, all these technologies and complexity. Instead, they only see one single high-level API, which makes the work a lot easier for them. And then, of course, we have various applications using that same API, so they can just reuse the whole <coughs> solution instead of redoing the same uh, different solutions for each application. So uh, a demo of how this works. Um, so what I'm going to show, to show here, uh, this is the Totem video player. Uh, what I did here was to write a plugin for Totem that would use Grillo to grab multimedia content from uh, a bunch of services that we already support. Uh, you can see on the right pane there are two, two tabs, uh, browser tab and the search tab. Uh, the browser tab is to interact with services uh, interactively, so that you can browse content that expose uh, with a certain hierarchy. Uh, for example, in the file system, it will be the, the file system hierarchy. Uh, in YouTube, it will be the standard feeds or categories that it exposes, and so forth. Uh, the search tab is about searching by text, but what we can uh, sit here. OK, so I'm now browsing the YouTube uh, content, which is posed as standard feeds, categories, and you have different categories, and so forth. Now, you can do the same thing for shortcuts, uh, and it exposes a set of categories with uh, well, the, the categories that shortcuts uh, groups uh, radius for. And we have also podcasts, Amanda, and a bunch of other uh, services. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, when I wrote this plugin, I wrote the code uh, that implements the browsing functionality once. And it works for all the services. Uh, there is no code specifically for YouTube, for shortcuts, or podcasts, or, podcasts or anything. Wrote the, the use case once, works for all the services I have here, and for any other services that may be added to Will in the future. It will just work. Uh, well, in this demonstration, I'm only showing browsing and searching. Uh, there's more that we support in Grillo, uh, uploading and pushing content, uh, removing content, uh, searching on multiple services at the same time, and other stuff. But in, in this demo, we'll only show uh, browsing and searching. Also, the, this is a, was a, a test. I wanted to see how this works for a real life application. So the, the interface is not fancy at all. But the point was to, to just see how it works, and I think it's good enough to, to get an idea. So if you want to see the, the searching part, it's the same thing. So you have a, a search text, you specify the text you're interested in searching for, you select the service on, on the combo from the set of searchable services, and well, you just search for whatever you are interested in, and it works. And uh, again, the, the, the point of this is that um, uh, you write the, the search use case just once and works for all the services implemented now and that may be implemented in the future as well. Uh, there is also a, another advantage, which is, as you can see, for, an, for, for a user, uh, this interface is very easy to use because YouTube, podcast, and every other service works the same. I don't have to learn how to use YouTube, how to learn how to use Vimeo, how to use uh, podcasts, whatever, they all work alike. It's the same user interface. And even though this is uh, pretty simple and not fancy at all, if you think about the set-the-box approach, for example, uh, 
you don't have to think how to make that happen for the user because the framework is already making that easy for you. Okay. So let's stop it here. So, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, I think it's uh, very interesting also to uh, check out some source code to see from an application point of view how much code is needed to do something like this. So what I have here is a demo application that we have for testing purposes. Uh, the code is pretty much the same that we have for that uh, token plugin that I showed before. And the interesting part that handles the browsing is here. I don't know if you probably can see this, right? saying the important bit is here. This is the API you need to browse content in Brello. GRL Media Source Browse. Uh, with this API, you can browse content from any service. Uh, it's independent on the service. The first parameter that you pass is the source object. The source is the object abstracting the service. Okay, so you have a source object for YouTube, a source object for a specific UBNP server on your network, source object for your mentor, or any other service. Uh, then you pass the container that you want to search to, to browse. Like you pass null for the root container, and then it may return some other containers that you can pass to this function to continue browsing. You pass a set of keys that you are interested in, like the title, thumbnail, uh, artist information, album information, whatever. Then you pass. Uh, page information, how many element, uh, elements you want to retrieve, and starting from which index. Uh, a set of flags that you can use to uh, control certain aspects of how this <coughs> operation is executed. Uh, I don't think it's worth going into that much detail in this presentation. And then you pass uh, a, a callback that will be invoked for every result that matches your request. Uh, because this is an asynchronous API. Uh, it will return an ID to uh, represent the operation, so you can cancel the operation or match results with a particular operation in case you have various operations running in parallel. And now, this is how the, the, that callback uh, looks like. Uh, as I said before, the callback will be invoked for every result that matches your request. So you get the source object that emitted the result, which should be the same uh, that you pass to the, to the browse operation. The ID of the operation, so you can match a specific result with a specific operation if, if you have multiple operations in parallel. Then you have a GRL media object, which represents the media that match your query, and this is the object that you can get uh, the metadata from, like uh, the title, the artist, the thumbnail, whatever you requested, the URI, so you can then pass it to a player and, and play it back. Uh, the remaining parameter is used for tracking purposes, so you know how many more results will be coming after this one as, as part of the same operation. So when it reaches zero, it means that the operation is finished and there are no more results. Uh, the user data that you passed uh, to the um, uh, to the browse operation, and in case there was some error, uh, an error parameter. And usually, uh, the callback looks like this. Usually, you would start by checking if there was an, an error and exit or whatever in that case. And if not, um, you would usually check if there's a media object, uh, and if that's if that's the case. You will get the information that you are interested in, like the title or the artist or whatever. You would usually check if it's a, a, an actual resource that you can play or, or, or show, or if it's a container that you can browse again. So this is this check that we have here. 
And once you uh, you have the data you're interested in, you do something with it. In this case, you just add it to the user interface, which is the, what we do here. And that's pretty much it. If you want to play the element, you would request the URL or whatever and, and, and pass this to the rendering engine, like the streamer or, or whatever you use. And then you would usually check if it was the last element in, in, in the operation. If it was, then you would uh, free resources or whatever was attached to this operation. And that's everything. I mean, with this, you can browse content from any service supported in Grillo. And it's really one uh, API for browsing, one callback for receiving the results, and that's all that you have to write. Uh, now, uh, if you think about searching, it's very much the same thing. You replace the container parameter of the browse operation with the search text, and that's it. It's even the same callback for receiving the results, so you can even share the callback to process the results from, from the search operation on the, on the browse. Uh, also, this application that we have here is in C, uh, but uh, thanks to GeoObject introspection, uh, we can also generate um, uh, bindings uh, for uh, other popular languages like Python, for example. And well, we have actually a demo UI uh, that it, that's being uh, written completely in Python as well. So Python developers can also use this. Uh, and well, other languages, thanks to well, the, the design of, of the object introspection, that's pretty easy to get. So we also have JavaScript support, for example. And, and so, so it's not a problem for, for, for uh, 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 to use Google from other languages at, at this point. Okay, so uh, that's a bit how, uh, how it works from from application developer point of view. Uh, now I, I would also like to show, uh, in case uh, you want to add new backends, new plugins for Willow, how, how does it work. So we use Ulib and Geobject and uh, creating a new backend for Grillo, a new service is basically creating a, a Geobject that implements a, a certain set of APIs. So what we have here is a podcast plugin that's very simple. And well, when we created this plugin, we just implemented a few virtual methods that were interesting for us. So this plugin can uh, browse uh, can search, can do uh, push content to, to the which is the list of, of podcasts we are interested in, uh, or remove content if in case we are not interested in a in, in certain feed anymore. So it does uh, a few things, uh, but the one I'm going to focus on is uh, the browse operation because it's the one I've been talking about all the time. So let's see how this browse operation is implemented here. Uh, to talk about this, I should first uh, explain how this podcast client works. So the idea basically is that the, the user can configure a set of, of feeds he's interested in. Uh, to do that, he uses the, uh, the store interface. So you have a URL of a feed you're interested in, you use this interface, and, and the plugin stores it in a database, okay? in a SQL database. So browsing is basically querying that database to retrieve the podcasts that the user pushed and show, show them to the user. And if the user browses one particular podcast, uh, one particular feed, it will retrieve the, the feed from the internet, parse it, and, and show the stuff. So. This is the actual implementation. Uh, you receive uh, as a parameter the uh, browser specification, which is basically the set of parameters that define the browser operation, like the keys the user requested, uh, the uh, paging information, like how many elements the user requested, and so forth, the container the user is browsing. And uh, well, in this case, what we do first is check if we have a database connection, otherwise we exit with an error. Uh, in case everything is fine, we save some information that we will use later on. And basically what we do here is checking 
if we are browsing the root container, in which case we should, we should show the list of fits that the user has configured, or otherwise, if we are browsing a specific fit, uh, then we have to retrieve that fit from the internet and parse it. So, uh, in the first case, we call this produce postgres. And it's very straightforward. We basically grab a connection to the database, uh, create a SQLite statement to query all the fields that the user pushed. We will run the SQLite statement. And for each result that we get, we create a URL media object. That's the one we will push in the callback for the user. And we, we invoke the callback with the parameters I mentioned before, the source, object, the operation ID, uh, uh, what this is, the, uh, in our case, this here. The media object with the metadata we retrieve from the database, uh, the remaining count estimation, and the user data that the user passed. So that's pretty much everything. Uh, if you wonder how this would change in the case that uh, I, I would use in some online service like YouTube, for example, uh, the only change is that instead of using a database, I would use YouTube APIs or whatever to grab an XML or anything else that I would parse and, 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 uh, and create from that the objects that I will uh, pass to this code. And that's basically it. And there's not, no, not much more to it. Uh, at this point, we only support writing backends in C, uh, but we have plans in the future to allow also Python developers to write clients, which would make it more accessible for some developers. And also we have some plans to uh, make some sources, some clients configurable, so for those that are simpler, uh, so that they are kind of uh, call a certain API over HTTP, uh, get an XML, parse it, and, and run the metadata, they can probably be scripted somehow. So. Uh, we will be looking to making this uh, doable in, in, in Google or just by, instead of writing a whole new plugin, just configuring a, a base plugin to with certain parameters and have that autom automatically working. Okay. So that was how Google looks like for plugin developers. We can write more plugins than just um, content providers, so we can write, write also uh, metadata providers, like if you have some service that can provide Argonat covers, for example, you can kind of uh, hook that in Google as well, and it will work uh, along for, with other uh, sources that you may have, and complement the, the metadata that they are providing. And there's some more stuff, but I think you get an idea. Now, if you are interested uh, in Knowing more about Quillo, uh, the project is hosted by the GNOME project. We have a wiki page there, we have Git repository, Cyrus channel, mailing list, and Doxilla. So you can check uh, these resources if you're interested. Now, this is credits for the images I, I've used in this presentation. And that's all. If you, you have any questions, I'll try to. Oh, we haven't really tried. Well, actually, we, we yeah, um, the Nokia M hundred, for example. Uh, we well, Nokia, the Nokia M hundred uses a multimedia framework called Math. So what we did was uh, writing uh, a math plugin that would use Grello and expose various objects in math in the math context. So you can uh, use them from the built-in Git player here. Uh, it has some limitations because math's approach is a bit more 
this is too limited compared to Grillo, so we can't really do all the stuff that we can do with Grillo here. So what part of the do you test it on? Uh, on for, 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 for the timing we, in embedded devices, we only tested this in, in MIMO, and on desktop, we only tested it on, on uh, Windows, yeah. yeah, normal Linux systems. Uh, although there shouldn't be really any problem with running this, it's very lightweight and it has very, very few dependencies. So any anything that runs duly, the object should. Is there any plans of looking how to uh, uh, introduce Grillo into other uh, systems, like for example, Myth TV? I mean, uh, this will complement Myth TV really, really well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are some people who have contacted us also because of that, people yeah. doing set of boxes and stuff because of yeah. course it makes a lot of sense. Uh, we haven't uh, really done any kind of cooperation yet, but I'm looking forward to that because uh, it's, it's natural, it's the reason we created the group for Will it be possible to pass credentials to um, to Grillo, for instance, for YouTube, for yeah. your channels and so on? Yeah. Uh, yes, there is a configuration API, so you can configure certain plugins with user credentials to do whatever you do. For example, for Flickr, the Flickr plugin allows that, and when you browse, you see a category with your photos and stuff. Okay, so thank you for listening.